business system, the prospects for global cooperation and partnership, the future of multilateral institutions. We know about the multitude of challenges and the complexities of managing a rapidly evolving pandemic of unprecedented reach and multiple effects. Today, we want to take stock of the current thinking in Europe and India alike and identify the issues and opportunities for further and future EU-India cooperation. We plan to continue organizing webinars, inviting also further presentations by other participants of the EU-India Think Tank Twinning Initiative, which has just started a third phase of further two years, and of course, inviting also new voices who wish to join our regular EU-India deliberations. Before Moving to the debate, allow me some housekeeping announcements. Only a few of particular relevance of this type of webinar. So all participants are welcome to ask questions to the panelists by using the Q&A box on your screen. Your questions will come to the panelists, time permitting, of course. Once we've done the first round of interventions, we will come to a moderated Q&A sessions. For this session, we will pick up selected questions, read them out, and invite panelists to answer them. Please, in the interest of time, keep them short and sharp. Secondly, this seminar is relayed live on Facebook, the Facebook page of the EU delegation. So if you have problems following on this screen, please dial into the Facebook page. So now I would like to invite His Excellency Ugo Astuto, Ambassador of the European Union to India, to deliver the welcome and introductory remarks, which will set the scene for the ensuing panel discussion. Ugo, over to you, please. Thank you very much, Frederike, and thank you to all friends and colleagues uh, who are joining us today. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to introduce, to open this seminar. I look forward to the discussion and to the insights that you're going to share with us. From my side, I would like to, to start by saying that um, if there is one thing that this crisis has taught us, uh, if there is one lesson learned, it, is that a pandemic spares no one. Uh, it stops at no border and recognizes no national difference. Uh, it's, it's a graphic evidence of the fact that the world is one. So tackling this global crisis and its consequences requires solidarity requires multilateral solutions, cooperation at international and regional level. And the EU is, uh, is, uh, is strongly committed to uh, international cooperation and uh, in, um, in contributing to multilateral solutions to, to, um, to address the pandemic and its consequences. And we are working with our international partners um, uh, to do so. Domestically, we have stepped up our cooperation with member states and we have set in motion an array of common tools to address the immediate health challenge and the risk of a severe economic fallout. Uh, it's fair to say that at the beginning of the crisis, um, no one around the world was uh, really prepared for something of this magnitude and, and the European Union was um, no exception, but after a bumpy start, I think that now, I mean, for, for the past few weeks, the European Union has been standing up to the challenge remarkably. We have put in place extraordinary measures to deal with the crisis. We have created a common stockpile, for instance, of medical equipment. We have invested heavily in, um, in uh, treatment, uh, in vaccines. We have organized joint procurement of urgent supplies. We, we have also set up a team of experts and researchers to, to share the best knowledge and to save lives. So in short, we are using every available tool to save lives and to protect the livelihood in, in a truly European spirit of solidarity. I, I'm convinced that Europe will emerge from this crisis um, even stronger as a union grounded on trust and solidarity. And I'm, I'm happy to say that the EU and India share the same values in this aspect, the same values of democracy, of pluralism. We, we both believe in an open society and we, and we strongly believe in multilateralism. Uh, this is particularly relevant now as we are facing uh, this global crisis which requires a coordinated global response. 
uh, the European Union and India are already working together, be it bilaterally or in multilateral fora, uh, such as the United Nations or G20, precisely to share a global response, which is up to the challenge based on cooperation and solidarity. We have together to mitigate the impact of the virus, we have to foster research, research and innovation, research on vaccines. And we have, to, we have to share best practices. We have to ensure that knowledge and expertise um, are universally disseminated and that information is uh, transparently shared. Uh, as part of our global response, the European Union has also mobilized um, a considerable, a significant amount of um, funds, uh, 15 billion or so, to help vulnerable par partners around the world, particularly in Africa, to, to, to deal with the impact of the pandemic. So we will need a coordinated response also in the wake of the crisis, also to face economic consequences of the virus. We are, we are all in this together and we must together address the situation. The, the G20 coordination will be key in this respect and I'm very happy to, to acknowledge, to, to, to pay tribute to the fact that India has uh, very rightly started the conversation in the G20 about the virus. So the European Union and India share priorities that will be central in shaping also the world's agenda in a post-COVID scenario. I'm referring here, for instance, to the fight against climate change. Uh, we have to work together for a greener, sustainable growth. We have to work together for increased resilience. Uh, we want to foster research and innovation. We want to invest in digitization. And we want to uphold our values in doing so, uh, supporting a rules-based world governance uh, based in multilateralism. So in, in short, the European Union and India have converging interests and shared values. And we, we shall together unleash the full potential of this strategic um, partnership. Uh, we, we can succeed in overcoming this crisis only if we act in a coordinated manner globally. And I'm convinced that in this respect, you and India can lead. You and India can lead in this endeavor. Thank you very much. I wish you a very good and fruitful uh, session. Many thanks, Ugu, Ambassador. I'm sure the audience will tune in again on 9 May, this Saturday, when the EU delegation will further publicize the EU contributions on the occasion of celebrating Europe Day. Moving on to the panel, and given the time limits, and because this is a first stock-taking event, which will be followed up by more specific discussions, we have opted for presentations plus Q&A format. So I will henceforth be calling the speakers one by one to deliver their remarks within the agreed time limits. As all speakers are very well known to the audience and their CVs and publication lists are readily available, I will invite them to start their presentations immediately without further preliminary remarks. Thereafter, as mentioned, the curated questions from the audience with the possibility for all speakers to come in again and also comment on the remarks by other panelists. So over to Singapore, Raja Mohan. I'm so glad that you're with us and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Frederick. It's so wonderful seeing you uh, on a long distance and uh, delighted to be part of this uh, transcontinental uh, webinar. Uh, we are friends in, uh, in Brussels and in Delhi together talking about uh, India, Europe in the, in the new situation. So what uh, I think we have Ambassador Astuto uh, you know, starting us off uh, with this uh, keynote. What I'll do is I'll just make uh, three sets of points. I mean, I think uh, on the principal contradiction that has emerged in the world between US and China and what it does to, uh, uh, to us, the rest of us, certainly uh, Europe and, uh, and India. Uh, to start with, I mean, the US-China relationship for nearly uh, 50 odd years, uh, they've been uh, on the same side, starting from the early 70s, uh, political cooperation, economic cooperation, and deeper economic integration uh, between the two. Uh, the tensions between the two were boiling over even before the COVID crisis came. But after the crisis, now I think the contradictions uh, between the world's number one and number two economic powers, number one and number two military powers, have really 
deeply sharpened. And, and I think this is a, a, a completely new situation for most of us uh, in the world. What makes this confrontation less amenable for a compromise, I think, is the volatile domestic political situation. Uh, as it happened, uh, the crisis has coincided with the US presidential elections. That, so that has made China the central issue uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the in the US elections. While the Democrats and the Republicans might disagree on a lot of things, uh, that there is a China problem is something they agree. So it makes it harder for the Americans to step back at this point of time. Second, in China, I think Deng Xiaoping, sorry, in Xi Jinping is completing his second term uh, and his own legacy is going to be up in the air. And he is under even more pressure not to be seen as compromising with the Americans. So I think the stage is set for a fairly intense uh, confrontational uh, situation for, for between the two powers. So where does this leave us, India, Europe, and the others? Now, I would say three broad propositions here before I move on to my second position. One, we need to maintain a firm and a disciplined engagement with China. China has become assertive. Uh, it's become fairly muscular in its uh, diplomacy or in its foreign policy. Uh, some of us in Asia are seeing it in South China Sea, even in the middle of this crisis. So, but, but we can't say, look, we'll turn our back on China. So we have to engage China, but engage with a firm, decisive uh, approach and with a, with a clear sense of uh, objectives and purpose. Second, I think we can't do without the Americans. I think any fight against the virus and the long-term solutions to the problems that it has brought to the fore, we need the Americans in. Therefore, uh, keeping the Americans in the conversation becomes important because the US seems distracted. Uh, the US seems to be tempted by isolationism. Uh, US and Europe are, of course, are longstanding partners. India is a new friend of the United States. So I think we need to find ways of keeping the Americans in, uh, in the conversation. That's our second choice. Uh, the third uh, imperative for us is while we, while we want the Americans and the Chinese both to be in, we can't leave ourselves at the mercy of the Americans and the Chinese because their domestic politics are volatile. Therefore, India and Europe and other middle powers like Japan uh, and Australia and other nations, we need to do a lot more together so that we create the conditions for where the US and China can collaborate. So that's my uh, first point. So the second point I'd like to make is on the impact on globalization. Globalization was already under stress before, and today, thanks to the, the crisis, uh, the, the pressures on globalization have become uh, very, very sharp. Uh, globalization has deeply benefited most countries, certainly in Asia, I think China, India, most of Asia has deeply benefited from globalization. But the Asia and India can't expect this to continue at the cost of people who believe they've lost out of this globalization in Europe, in North America. The large sections of the people who believe globalization is not working for them anymore. Therefore, uh, we, we need to reform the, the structure of economic globalization, that it needs to benefit everyone. And it can't be one in which only one side benefits and the others feel at a loss. So therefore, if we want to succeed, we want to make sure this works we got to keep uh, the people in the developed countries very much a part of this, and that becomes a challenge. Uh, related to this is the question of uh, multilateral institutions, of governing global institutions. Here we've seen uh, the, the sense, right or wrong, that China that has, has gamed the global institutions, whether it is the World Trade Organization or the World Health Organization, and that China's uh, attempt to dominate these institutions or to turn these institutions to unilateral advantage is a, is a problem for the rest of us. Now, the degrees the, of how much it affects everyone is real. But I think in the wake of the controversy that we are seeing uh, in the case of uh, uh, World Health Organization and the deeper problems in the World Trade Organization that have been visible, we need, I think, India and, and Europe need to work together uh, to be able to produce a, a reforms of, uh, of uh, the World Trading Organization and the global economic system, as well as the World Health Organization, other institutions of, of global governance. That brings me to the, the third set of points where uh, here, I think uh, for India and Europe, I mean, we've had a lot of convergences uh, since the end of the Second World War, 
but they've not always been in alignment with each other. But today, I think for the first time, I think there is a sense of converging interests between India and Europe, both as middle powers, as powers that want a broad uh, framework of multilateralism. As we know that India has recently participated in the Alliance for Multilateralism that was initiated by the Europeans. And this has, I think, created a whole different context where uh, our multilateral interests today can be shaped, uh, shaped together. The second aspect, I think, uh, India and Europe have historically believed in a measured role for the state. Uh, we did not agree with our North American, you know, certainly American friends, uh, that the state can just be dismantled to suit the uh, neoliberal uh, capitalist order. Nor can we be like the Chinese or the Russians where the state is absolute and the state does everything. In fact, other day, Joseph Burrell uh, was talking to the, you know, high, you know, high High Commissioner for International Affairs was talking about the need for a more strategic view of state. A state, neither nanny state, nor a dismantled state that we need to work together to be able to produce a, a jointly that a better understanding of state uh, and how in the new context, the state will have to play a larger role in helping people within societies, as well as in constructing a global order that works for uh, everyone. And finally, uh, I'll say a word about the values and uh, that uh, Ambassador Sutra talked about, uh, that India and Europe are children of enlightenment, and that we need to work to make sure that the values of enlightenment uh, work for everyone today. Uh, and within that framework, that to be able to succeed in reforming globalization or uh, building a new order, we need uh, a far greater cooperation between ourselves as we work together to strengthen the multi, multi, multilateral system. So I'll stop here. I think I've run out of my time. Many thanks, Raja. Very interesting. Sure, we'll come back to many points in the discussion. So allow me to turn it over now to Dr. Fabian Sulek, Chief Executive of the European Policy Center. Hello, Brussels. We're interested in receiving your contribution. Um, thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, speak about cooperation um, also with India. Um, I think the starting point uh, for any discussion or the long-term impact of this crisis has to be the nature of the crisis itself. Um, we have to look at uh, what does this crisis mean and what kind of impacts are we going to see. And there I will personally focus very much on the longer term crisis, the economic crisis, um, which is still uh, to come. Not on the health crisis, um, but uh, I just want to emphasize that clearly the immediate priority is the health crisis and it needs to be under control uh, before we can even start thinking about some of these longer term aspects. But I think what we also are starting to see, despite the uncertainty, and I think we need to also acknowledge the uncertainty which is there, uh, but we're start, what we're starting to see is that this is not a cyclical downturn. This is not a short-term development which will pass. We will not be in um, a situation where we can go back to what was there before the crisis. Uh, we are actually talking about um, the, the word which is being used everywhere is the new normal. Um, what does that new normal mean? It means that in a number of areas, we have um, excess capacity uh, globally. Uh, we have a number of sectors where activity will not go back to the levels we have seen before. Uh, we will have massive state intervention um, in a number of different sectors. Um, we are already starting to see this in the aviation sector, um, but this will be something which we're seeing in many different areas. So governments uh, in one form or other will be shareholders in big companies which are acting globally, which have, will have an influence on global competition, on global trade, on global investment. Um, we will see um, that I think in many countries this will uh, reinforce the tendency of seeing your own country first, um, having a priority over uh, what does this mean for employment in my country? What does this mean um, for economic growth in my country? What does that mean for distribution uh, in my country? And uh, I think this crisis 
will have a very large distributional effect, um, both within countries and uh, between countries. And I think this distributional effect will be very difficult to manage. Um, we still haven't seen the full impact of this crisis, for example, in Africa, um, and the question of what will happen uh, to some of the more vulnerable countries uh, is, I think, one of the key um, questions in, in, this, uh, in this situation. Um, so, in many ways, um, I would stipulate that uh, global cooperation, multilateral cooperation, will come under even more pressure. Um, it will be reinforcing some of the pressures which we have seen already before the crisis. Um, but certainly when some of the uh, key global actors are facing more inwards, and we already um, had some comments on um, the tendency towards isolationism, the tendency towards uh, emphasizing my country first, um, then I think we are going to see even more challenges for the multilateral system. Uh, and that's paradoxical, because in some ways, uh, what the crisis emphasizes is exactly the opposite. Uh, the crisis is showing that there are global challenges which are not going to be solved at the national level. Um, and that is not only in relation to pandemics, um, but it is also in, relations to, um, in relation to issues such as climate change, in relation to issues such as global terrorism, the number of different areas where uh, we actually will have to solve these problems together. Um, if not, uh, they become even more difficult to handle in future. Uh, and certainly, um, I think we have to um, live with the realization that this kind of crisis um, is not a one-off, is something uh, which might well occur again, um, and that we need to be prepared the next time. So for me, the key question is how will countries resolve that paradox between, uh, on the one hand, the uh, political pressure to focus domestically, to be uh, able to deliver to domestic audiences uh, that uh, the country is taking care of them, uh, that it is addressing the crisis um, for them, but on the other hand, this need for global cooperation, for multilateralism to be able to address these kind of crises more effectively, uh, and in the end, this will come down um, to political decisions. It will come down to leadership. Um, and it will be answered differently in different parts of the world. Um, and I think this is one of the great uncertainties going forward. Um, I think we have in the European Union an instrument to bring countries together. But even with the close interdependence within Europe, there are some frictions. There are some difficulties with that. Uh, globally, this is even more difficult. Uh, we need to see that um, the fora such as uh, G20 can function in this kind of environment, um, that we can actually find solutions um, for the World Trade Organization and other international institutions, uh, which make them acceptable and which make them work effectively uh, across uh, the world um, to address these kind of crises. I'll leave it there, but very happy to come back to that in the discussion. Many thanks, Fabian. I think this ties in very well with the issues that Shada wanted to cover. So let me hand over immediately to Shada Islam, Director of Europe and Geopolitics, Friends of Europe in Brussels. The floor is yours, Shada. Welcome to thank the debate. Thank you very much, Frederica. Ambassador, hello, and thank you uh, for inviting me to this discussion. Imagine that in January, I was in Delhi, um, and we did have a face-to-face -face meeting and conferences, but now thanks to technology, when it works, we are together again. I, I do uh, concur quite a bit with what Raja and Fabian, my colleague at EPC, ha have said. Let me just give you my uh, 10 cents worth of what's happening here as well and how we can get out of the, the current crisis. Uh, I'm going to focus on three things. First, the different aspects of the crisis. Second, the crisis of leadership that we have at the moment. And also what's very important as we start easing the lockdown measures that we have in force across the world, how are we going to ensure that this big disruption doesn't turn into a big depression? Um, so let me kick off with how I view the current systems uh, being disrupted. Of course, there's health. I mean, there are, it has shown the crisis, COVID-19 has shown the vulnerability, 
vulnerability and the fragility of our world global health systems. Sometimes it's due to austerity measures, sometimes it's due to lack of funding, like lack of specialized skills. But we're seeing that in the post COVID-19 world, we'll have to do something massive to rebuild our health system. Because as Fabian has said, uh, these pandemics are not going to go away and COVID-19, many experts are saying, will be back in different shapes and different forms uh, through many, many years. So we really need to work together on uh, the hunt for a new vaccine against COVID-19. And there, as uh, Ugo has said, we're really delighted that the European Union, along with G20 countries, has taken a lead in this international pledging conference around, uh, along with the Gates Foundation. And it's also interestingly shown uh, to a world which has become quite anti-migrant, especially here in Europe and in many parts of the West, how much uh, migrants, uh, health workers are needed uh, in this situation. So I think it's shown something very important to our uh, skeptics, if you like, our, our uh, xenophobes uh, across uh, Europe, the populists who are against migration, that really uh, without migrant workers, the national health system in, in the UK for one, but even here in Belgium, would be really be more fragile than it is at the moment. Of course, the economic side of it as well is, of course, devastating. And uh, Fabian has talked about Africa. I'd also like to mention South Asia. And I'd like to mention the plight of middle income countries, countries that were actually coming out, rebuilding uh, their administrations, rebuilding their systems, a real a middle class was emerging, was fragile. We knew that, but it was emerging and it was driving uh, the economies of many middle income countries in Africa, Asia and Latin America. And now those sectors are really decimated. So we have to think about debt relief and Africa, of course, African leaders are, are, are leading the way, spearheading demands for debt relief. And I have to say the IMF and the World Bank are responding to these calls, but we need a wider safety net. We need more relief, middle income countries that rely on trade. I'll come back to that in a minute, but also uh, something that we've always sort of shied away from, uh, the idea of basic income is back on our agenda. And we're seeing this in Europe where we will have the financial means to ensure that. But I think we need a worldwide basic income system, which is calibrated, of course, to the domestic GDP and the domestic economy. But I think we can't run away from that. And then um, also geopolitical, the COVID-19 crisis has impacted on, as uh, Raja has said, already a very deteriorating and a very acrimonious, I would say even toxic geopolitical situation, due of course, essentially to US-China uh, name calling, blame games, et cetera, going on. But that's creating a very difficult atmosphere at the moment, fragilizing us even further, because we're looking for leadership and we're not finding it in the United States. And of course, China is not ready for it yet either. And the European Union, I'll come back to that in a second. We are internally engaged with our own concerns, rightly so at the moment, but we're also looking outwards. And Europe can't do it alone. Europe will have to do it uh, with Asian countries and African countries. My final point on this uh, section is really the societal impact. Yesterday, we at Friends of Europe had a conversation with the, the Vice President Switzer uh, about societies, how our societies are being impacted, the traumas uh, COVID-19 lockdowns are creating for our elderly, for our young people, for our minorities, and those societal impacts, I think, somehow in this game that we're playing, geopolitics, etc., get uh, sidelined get overlooked. And I think it's very important that we keep in mind that some of the most vulnerable people already in, in, in many parts of the world, the poorest of the poor, the informal sector, if you like, that has keeps millions alive, uh, the daily wage earners, all of those are really out of jobs. Um, so we'll have to look at that as well. So there is indeed, uh, my second point, there is indeed a crisis of globalization. Uh, the system is weakened, crippled, but I don't think it's dead. And I think that's what uh, Fabian and Raja were saying as well. But can we, can we afford to let it just drift as such? And I have always said that this is perhaps that moment, opportunity to have what I call, um, what many call actually, a Bretton Woods moment. At the end of the Second World War, wise leaders from across the world, the West in that time mostly, came together and decided no more wars. Uh, 
uh, no more infighting, no more confrontation. I would wish, I would pray that our leaders of today across the world would come together and have that Bretton Woods moment again to rebuild our very fragilized multilateral systems. The WTO has been on its, uh, let's say it's been crippled uh, by US-China infighting for many, many years already. It needs to be rebuilt and it needs to be rebuilt in an inclusive way. They can no longer be rule makers and rule takers. We'll all have to do it. We'll all have to do it together. The G20 has emerged once again, as it did in the 2008 financial crisis, as a very important global player. I would wish it to be uh, strengthened, maybe institutionalized, maybe reinforced. But I think the G20 is important. And I would say, forget the G7. I think the G7 is a relic of another century. It's the G20 where actions will happen. And I would say, let's really rebuild the credibility of the WHO. Once again, US-China infighting has weakened an already, let's say, not a very, very significant global player, the World Health Organization. But the pandemic has shown that this is going to be the big issue of today. So let's rebuild the WHO. And finally, on this section, I would say, let's also use the ASEM framework that we have. Ambassador, we have the Asia-Europe meeting. Uh, we set this up many years ago, and we will have a summit in Cambodia. Asia and Europe, India and Europe uh, can play a role together. I'm very, very reassured and encouraged by countries like New Zealand, Singapore, Korea, um, Chile coming together, uh, ensuring that medical supply routes, uh, global supply chains are kept open. This is extremely important. So we have a role to play, big and small. So I'm not just a superpower girl. Uh, I believe that smaller powers, middle powers have great strengths. My final point really is as what do we do as we come out of the exits, uh, as we come out of the lockdowns, we exit them. How are we going to build this recovery? And Fabian said so. It should be a green and sustained recovery, but it's not going to be easy. There will be pushbacks from across the world. We're seeing it already, Fabian, within our own uh, industrial sectors, how many are pushing back against the Green Deal at this stage, using this opportunity to push agendas uh, which they find uncomfortable anyway. Um, so can we have a great reset? Somebody talked about resilience. I like that word, but I like the word reset and transformation even more. Let's use this opportunity to rethink uh, our, our, our economic systems. I talked about the basic uh, income, but I think it's so important that we keep our markets open. Uh, there's no economic nationalism. We have to keep our markets open. Yes, we need to reshore and make sure that some of our essential medical supplies are not entirely dependent on one country or one region. We can ensure that our global supply chains are clean and green, but we cannot, and I think we cannot bring back, we can't have that kind of strategic autonomy where everything is produced at home. And I think our leaders need to make sure that our public understand that. Um, we need to have a gender balanced recovery. This is very important, Frederica, Ambassador. The 2008 global recovery, it was absolutely gender blind, but we have seen how many women are affected by COVID-19. They're frontline doctors and nurses, medical workers, but they're also in the informal sector, which I said to you earlier, is decimated across the developing world. So we will have to focus on that. And then, uh, and I'm coming to my end, Frederica, e-commerce. We have seen just how much we depend now on online uh, activities, shopping online, talking to each other online, but the e-commerce discussions in the WTO are not moving very fast. And I think we need to put some of our um, force behind that. And finally, I would say to you, um, easier travel for medical experts. I just said earlier how important it is uh, how we've shown that this crisis, we could not come out of it. We could not have our health systems operating without migrant workers. And this is something that will have to be considered as well. It's a proposal made by India, I think, in the World Trade Organization to have easier travel, uh, fewer visa restrictions, et cetera, for medical experts. And I think this is going to be very important. So I'll end with that. Um, I, I'd like to just say this is no time for economic nationalism. This is really a time for economic leadership, collaboration, but I agree with what Fabian has said. That's going to be a hard story to sell, and that's why wise leaders are needed at this time. Thank you very much.
Chada for raising so many topics and also injecting, let's say, a note of warning. This will not go automatically into the right direction. And I think we will come back to this also in the Q&A session. I can already see some questions coming in. So let me invite um, Harsh Pant to join the debate, Director, Studies and Head of Strategic Studies at the Observer Research Foundation, New Delhi. Please, the floor is yours. We're eager to hear your voice in the debate. Uh, thank you, Frederike. And uh, let me also thank you on behalf of ORF for having uh, us join this conversation, very important one. Uh, I think, uh, you know, a, a number of points have been raised about the larger global order, which uh, largely I concur with. But I think what uh, I would like to emphasize is, it, is, is that in some ways, this is the Eureka moment for, for a lot of us, uh, because we have been discussing these trends um, for a long time now, you know, the, the contestation, geopolitical contestation, gathering momentum, multilateral institutions under stress, the ideas around globalization and how do you, how do we restructure our economies have been under the public policy domain for quite some time. But I think what this crisis has told us is something very fundamental is that those ideas and, and the, the vulnerabilities are very real now and they have been exposed. I think exposure is on all sides. You know, on the one hand, if you see how uh, China has been exposed in some ways, Chinese foreign policy, its conduct, its diplomacy, its, its mismanagement, its use of information has been exposed. On the other hand, let's be honest, uh, the West has been exposed as well. The vulnerabilities in Washington, the vulnerabilities of EU have been exposed. The leadership vacuum, uh, which has been, I think, Shada very, uh, very uh, raised this uh, very pertinently, which I think is, has been a real issue here in this crisis. Uh, and, and that is what gives space to uh, some, you know, to, to middle powers, to countries like India, uh, to emerge and to make a case that, look, we can't rely on the on the traditional uh, uh, you know aspects of global leadership we can't rely on washington and on beijing or on even on brussels to to put you know pull our chestnuts out of the fire and that is what i think has also driven a lot of debate in india and and that's what i sort of want to wanted to focus on uh, because a, a lot of the discussion here has been that look uh, you know if you if you see the initial stages of the of the epidemic and ambassador mentioned that point uh, it was quite, um, uh, you know, quite distinct uh, in the way that there was complete chaos at the leadership level. It was as, as if every nation was there to fend for itself. The global multilateralism was not working. The ideas around global coordination were not working. No one, no one was even listening and talking about them. So clearly there was a, there was a potency to this crisis and, and, uh, that, that, that it exposed in some ways the vulnerabilities of the global order that we were, we were all talking about. We were all talking about the structural uh, infirmities. We were all talking about ideational problems and, 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 and institutional problems. But I think in some ways, the geopolitical contestation is now out of the bag, as Raja rightly pointed out. The institutional stress is out of the bag. We, we, I mean, uh, while we can be optimistic that it can be managed, I don't think that uh, we can rely on that optimism to carry us forward over the next uh, short to medium term. And I think uh, the, uh, the ideational constructs around globalization, which were being contested in any case, are also out in the open that we, we can't actually believe, yes, we want more globalization, not less. We want more global coordination, not less. But God knows what kind of leadership we will get over the next short to medium term. So can we rely on that? Can we rely on this idea that uh, we will all buy into that logic of greater coordination is good? Yes, we, we can hope that we will have wise leaders. But I think uh, hope is, again, not a policy. So clearly, I think when you, when you think of policy think tanks, when we think of our role here to inject a sense of realism also into this debate as to what can be achieved in the short to medium term, where countries which, are, which see themselves as middle powers and which see themselves as bereft of uh, institutional frameworks, multilateral frameworks, which are not working, what can they do? So clearly, EU has a very important role to play there. And I think the, the, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's wonderful to see Euro European Union now coming back on track, doing its job. Uh, but, but I think what, what in India we saw was, I think, something very distinct. An Indian prime minister made two very interesting points, somewhat contradictory. But I think he made this point that, you know, one of the most important lessons we are learning is that self-reliance is so important. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, for a country, for a prime minister, for a leader who till, the, uh, till a few weeks uh, before this crisis uh, was uh, tom toming the idea of globalization, against a world which was sort of uh, turning its back on globalization. This is a very serious statement that I think what we are learning now, the leadership in this country is learning that self-reliance is going to be a mantra that you, you will need to have, you need, I think India will need to think very creatively about what its strategic industries are 
pharmaceuticals. What do we do with pharmaceuticals? Uh, do we rely on China uh, for our API imports? Uh, and I think also as we move into the uh, contestation of emerging strategic sectors, the contestation among them, uh, the contestation emerging uh, about the future of uh, technology, uh, what, uh, what can a country like India expect from the, from the world? And I think what can it contribute to the world? And I think that is something that the Prime Minister in India has been talking about a lot of conversations about what do you do going forward about India's own manufacturing base. Again, a debate that had been in, in the Indian context uh, has been there for a long time. But I think it has, this crisis has given it an immediacy, uh, which I think people are feeling. Uh, there is a genuine um, sense uh, amongst the ordinary individuals as well as at the top leadership that something has gone awry in the way uh, India has pursued uh, globalization along with other countries. And that needs to be rectified. We can't really be relying on global supply chains that are dominated by one country or by a group of countries. We really need to restructure those global supply chains. And I think that's a conversation that is happening everywhere. And in India also, that has a certain potency. So, you, uh, so I think when you look at the Indian response, it was very interesting. From the very beginning, it was about uh, that we certainly, this crisis needs global coordination. And India, in its own ways, uh, made sure that SARC was mobilized again from a government that uh, had, did not have much, did not put much value on SARC uh, in, its, in its first few years, found that every single forum now needs to be used. So from SARC to G20 to NAM, all of these forums have been used by India to project a sense of uh, global uh, to regional coordination. And that is, that is something that I think is very interesting, that you have now middle powers, and, some, and I think someone talked about a number of these countries, smaller countries in their own ways, trying to help the region, South Korea, Taiwan, India, Japan, um, and then you have uh, France and Germany along with the, EU, with the, you know, the, the whole uh, multilateralism alliance. I think all of this has been a recognition that something, uh, that the global uh, order is changing in ways that perhaps smaller countries, middle powers will have to find their own voice. And that is what we have seen in this crisis, which I think is very um, interesting, uh, very optimistic. Uh, and, I, and I think that gives you hope that the binary that we have gotten used to, uh, while it will be very difficult to manage this, uh, the, these tensions between in, uh, America and uh, China going forward, but I think for, for countries like India, for, uh, for EU member states, for EU as an organization, it will be imperative to look at that uh, coordination in, 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 in that mix. So I think when you look at Indian response, when you look at Indian leadership, it has been very proactive, it has been very forthright, it has been in some ways uh, you know, a counterpoint to many other countries who were all looking more and more inwards and India was driving this conversation, or at least trying to drive this conversation outwards. So whether it was pushing SARC, pushing G20, or pushing even a, even a moribund organization like NAM. So clearly, I think the lessons are being learned here in New Delhi. And I think this will have a major impact on the way India deals with its external stakeholders. But with EU, there is a genuine alignment now that needs to be uh, you know, taken forward on a range of areas. So I would end there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Harsh, for injecting the Indian perspective, a sense of realism or sobriety, but also giving us a few ideas for the list of future topics for discussion. I've well noted the issue of globalization, self-reliance, this whole issue would be very interesting to tease out in a more specific discussion. So let me invite um, the final speaker for this first round of interventions, Stephen Blockman, again from Brussels. Head of EU Foreign Policy and of Institutional Affairs at the Center of European Policy Studies. I'm glad to see you back in our midst and for the your remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Federica. The risk of coming last is, of course, that everything has already been said, but not by everyone. Let me, let me therefore try and refine some of the points with which I concur um, and maybe take issue with, uh, with, uh, with smaller issues as well. I liked uh, Harsh's uh, Eureka moment uh, phrase, and, and would put it more, would put more emphasis on the on the first two words, or two letters rather, Eureka moment. Is there one? And, uh, and maybe apply it also to China. I think there's there's certainly been a wake up call here, in many European capitals um, about the way China has handled its Chernobyl uh, moment. So certainly chime with those uh, earlier comments. And I think it's fair to say also that uh, the mood is indeed hardened uh, in many European capitals. Um, already, of course, prior to the Corona crisis with the entire 5G debate, uh, with the BRI uh, investment screening um, uh, debate as well. And I think here, uh, even including uh, the 17 plus one uh, countries, 
I think here there is um, an opportunity, in fact, to recalibrate uh, the European Union's approach towards China. 2020 was go always going to be a very important year in that uh, respect. Um, a summit scheduled for the 30th of March this year uh, was, of course, um, well postponed or, or even cancelled. There is a Leipzig summit in September coming up, uh, which Chancellor Merkel has, uh, has a lot riding. But with the delays in negotiations on uh, the comprehensive agreement uh, on investment, for example, um, th there is an opportunity lost at the one hand in getting this reality check um, for you know, Beijing's promises to open its own market up to uh, European companies, um, to uh, put new systems in place in order to prevent uh, forced technology um, transfers. And on the other hand, the delay provides an opportunity, of course, to, to recalibrate that, um, that relationship, which was otherwise a bit sleepwalking, I, I'd say, uh, driven by, you know, uh, the lure of money, Chinese money, um, but, but not really aware of, you know, the, the type of um, well, communist system that, uh, that we are dealing with, despite, you know, the human rights concerns which have been um, which have been uh, there already. So here I agree with the uh, with points raised by Raja and others that um, maintaining the relationship with China is very important. I think this correction uh, which the coronavirus is, uh, is offering is in fact very important for the European Union to double down on its EU strategic priorities to achieve a more balanced position perhaps between the G2. Um, concerns about Trump's uh, America and even, you know, the next president's uh, position on, on China are very well known, of course, but the calibration was needed on the, on the EU-China side. Not to be in a sort of, you know, equidistant uh, position vis-a-vis -vis the G2, but rather to maintain a more strategically autonomous, um, you know, uh, position and to be able to, um, uh, to define its own priorities and promote its own interests. Um, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, both. Here I also like to pick up on a point was, which was raised on, uh, I think by, by Shada and others, also Fabian, on uh, ensuring strategic autonomy. There's a debate going on within the European Union, even within the European Commission, between a more protectionist line which has been um, defended of course by President Macron who claims industrial sovereignty basically and are, advocates reshoring um, companies in strategic fields such as the medical sector back um, to Europe, if indeed France. Breton, uh, Commissioner Breton is very much defending that line as well, with Rutte and others um, also stressing the importance of, of increased investment screening of Chinese FDI uh, into Europe in these strategic sectors. Whereas others like Commissioner Hogan and, and Free Marketeers are of course advocating that greater access to other markets um, is needed by concluding more FTAs with, uh, with countries. And this brings, of course, not just uh, India back uh, into, into the picture and the need, you know, to think harder about uh, how we revive these uh, FTA talks um, between the two parties, uh, but it comes on the back of um, new FTAs which have been concluded with Mexico, new negotiations which have been opened with Australia and New Zealand. So the EU keeps on walking that uh, twin track, uh, if you want. And um, I think it's that balance which ultimately will be crucial. Of course, in keeping with you know a multilateralist business model, which is the European Union's own, and in trying to, um, to, to, to shore up like-minded countries in uh, reform mechanisms for the WTO. I think here there's attempts have already been made by the European Commission and there's, there's no need to be, uh, to be naive about these things that the EU would be able to, to lead those efforts on its own. Uh, a triangulation of a trade relationship with China and the US is crucial for this. It was the US that killed um, the upload body it was conversely also the US that engaged with the Japanese and with the European Un Union in a plurilateral agreement on uh, industrial subsidies, thereby coaxing um, uh, China on that particular issue. So here, rather than going uh, you know, through the royal road of the WTO, I think plurilateral agreements that buttress uh, the WTO 
in areas mentioned by Shada, uh, medical, e-commerce, and by using, um, in a temporary way, of course, the type of arbitration mechanisms uh, which resonate or replicate the dispute settlement mechanism which is owned to the WTO could at least revive a spirit uh, of trade liberalization and keep uh, the dispute settlement body mechanism, the plus applet body, um, um, alive in outside of the WTO. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Stephen. So we come to the Q&A moment. We have a lot of questions, so we cannot read them all out in detail and uh, also identify speakers uh, or people who ask questions, but I hope we will have an additional interesting round of debates. So let me first take um, questions more of a political nature, then move on to some of the economic uh, questions and um, later we come to EU and India relations. I think that will be, will be sort of the best uh, sequence. So one question on democracy, you know, the functionality of democracy, it was directly addressed to Dr. Fabian Zulek is, how does one reconcile the domestic pressure and need for global commitment on a coordinated basis, particular in a democracy where leaders have to behave under electoral compulsions so perhaps we take that um, together with the question. It was addressed to Roger, but I would think that also one or two of the EU uh, colleagues would be interested is um, if the EU is struggling sometimes to define a common position, notably vis-a-vis -vis China, how can we have a more effective EU-India collaboration uh, on China with a view also to fixing China's accountability? Perhaps I throw these two in, so I need disciplined answers because we have two sets, at least two sets of, of interesting questions. So over to Fabian, then Raja, and then whoever wants to, to come in as well on the, on the second one. Fabian. Yes, um, thank you very much uh, for, for those questions. Um, I think, uh, firstly, I, I think it's very interesting to look at the performance of different systems uh, within this crisis. Um, when the crisis started, uh, there was, um, a lot of comment on how democracies were unable to react um, as well as some other kinds of regimes um, to this crisis. I think when we actually look at it now, um, I wouldn't say that is the case. Uh, what we have seen is a very differentiated picture uh, with uh, some democracies performing very well, but also uh, other systems performing well and vice versa. So. I think uh, the jury is out in how far um, the different political systems um, function better or worse. And I think much of that has to do with the kind of leadership uh, which we're seeing within that crisis. Um, I think what we are seeing all across the world is that populations are willing to endure quite a lot uh, if they see the need for it and if they are convinced that this is based on um, a proper assessment of the situation and that they're being told the truth. Um, I think we have seen a lot of reaction uh, to people feeling that they're being deceived um, by systems, by uh, experts um, or uh, by politicians. So for me, um, the question of whether democracies will be able to convince their populations that cooperation uh, is uh, better than isolationism. Yeah. Uh, it depends on the leadership in those countries, and it depends on uh, whether these leaders can convincingly show uh, that cooperation is something which is not done um, because uh, only of a moral imperative, but that it is actually enlightened self-interest, that this is something which helps uh, everyone to address the worst impact of these crises because it does not um, stop at any border. Thank you. So, Raja? Yeah. On, the EU, yeah. on the EU, I mean, uh, I mean, I wouldn't want to get into uh, no, EU's internal uh, affairs. The EU has always uh, been a work in progress and, and I think uh, it's really up to the European participants to say, look, there are issues, serious issues that have emerged. But Europe has seen this before, and I think uh, what matters for India is really we need a strong Europe. We need a Europe that is coherent. 
and how that arrived at is, is Europe's business, uh, but I think we strongly support a, a, a European Union because without a strong European Union, because without that, the challenge of managing the Eurasian order is, is going to get a lot tougher. On the question of democracy, I think let me take a slightly different tone. I mean, I think the tendency has been to dismiss the backlash against globalization as some kind of populism. Uh, these are kind of characters who are really, you know, walked into the state they were not supposed to walk in. But I think that's against the very logic of democracy. I think the uh, criticism of globalization, the reaction against outsourcing of jobs, insourcing of labor, all within a generation that has so transformed these environments of the developed world, those are serious issues. So uh, countries are not mere economic units of efficiency. They're social communities, they're political communities. And I think the good thing about democracies is, is the, the, the pressure that we've seen in the last few years is a good way of correcting the course. While we say globalization cannot be reversed, you can't have a system that doesn't work for a large number of people in any society. So therefore, I think we should see the criticism, and I see we already see, in fact, in the US, uh, the, even the Democratic Party is adapting to uh, the question of uh, you can't have total free trade. Uh, many European countries too are, are returning to uh, concerns about a more equi equitable internal distribution. Uh, one of you talked about the, the distributional effects and also a fairer system that, that has to work for everyone. So I think the democracies in the end uh, will make better of this because the self-correcting mechanisms that we have, rather than the utter clarity that often uh, you know, defines the, some of the activities uh, of closed societies and the costs they pay are going to be longer term, much higher. Thank you. So I saw one more hand raised from the panelists to address this cluster of questions. Yes, please, Shada, do come in. Thank please. you, yes, very briefly. There's an assumption uh, in many parts of Asia, and I would say in, in India also, that somehow the European Union is focused just on China. Uh, I'd like to assure you, I've followed EU-Asia relations for 30 years, if not more, uh, first as a journalist and now as a think tanker. The European Union's Asia policy is really an Asia policy. I know our media across the world, uh, in Europe and in America, especially I would say, is absolutely obsessed with the China story, the China scare, the China fear, allegedly, allegedly. Uh, I can also tell you from my experience that Europe is involved not only in India for years, followed that conversation for many years, but with Japan, with Korea, increasingly with Thailand, uh, and of course, we always tend to forget uh, Japan or the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. These are very interesting stories. Of course, there's Afghanistan, Pakistan as well. So our, our, our European leadership, and I can tell you, I've, I'm very critical of some of our things when it comes to Asian policy or trade policy, but it's wrong to think that we are only focused on China. This is an obsession uh, which is very strong in America, but increasingly also coming into play on, uh, in, in, in Europe. It, there's more to Asia than China when it comes to its relationship with Europe. And ASEM, uh, that I uh, continue to believe in, uh, is the geopolitical um, reflection of this Euro-Asia story. Now, when it comes to uh, whether it's democracies or authoritarians, I'll just say one thing to you. Um, I, uh, there's been a lot of talk about how female leaders, once again, I'm coming to the gender issue, but I'm on a panel with so many men, apart from you, Friedrika, and uh, I think these issues tend to be overlooked by some of our male colleagues, uh, especially when there's talk of a war uh, on COVID-19 and somehow strong men are needed to deal with it. I will tell you uh, from uh, our experience recently that the people, the leaders who've been able to handle it efficiently as uh, Fabian said, in transparency, with compassion and with empathy, have been female leaders. Now, I'm not saying it's only them, but leaders who show that kind of sensitivity and who listen to science and who the people trust are the, are, are the leaders who are most affected, are the countries that are, let's say, tackling this uh, in, a, in, in a more efficient manner. And finally, today, if you look at some of our papers, there are uh, reports saying that the two countries where the death rates and COVID-19, um, let's say, mishaps uh, are the greatest, are Britain 
and the United States, led by two so-called strong men who at least pretend to be strong men. That's it. Many thanks. I think again, food for thought and also some good topics for our list of further webinars. And this is not a threat. So let me turn it over to a few economic or questions with economic focus, but I can also see that we time is up very soon, only 10 minutes left. Um, so we can have five minutes on this and then five on EU-India collaboration because meanwhile several questions came in. So I need to summarize questions. So my apologies also to the audience who've written very good questions. But um, one concerns um, WTO, uh, the closure and so on. There's full appreciation, of course, for the need for reform. But at the moment, keeping markets open and refraining from economic isolation seems to be an economic imperative, however, not necessarily the, the strategy chosen by most or by many people, also powerful countries around us. Then one question um, suggests that uh, we continue to focus cooperation when we call for more cooperation worldwide, meaning more on the development assistance and so on sector. We uh, focus that on spending. However, don't you see the need for improved coordination also when it comes to taxation, for instance, tolling tax, transaction tax and, and other matters. So uh, I think it's a call for broadening also the economic toolbox, uh, so to speak, that may be uh, called upon to, to manage the crisis. And then one more economic uh, question um, or international versus economic and globalization directed to, to Harsh Pant. Uh, on the issue of, um, of self-reliance. Uh, it could elaborate on that concept and also tease out the tension, obviously, that is there with a globalized world. So perhaps turning it over to Harsh first um, and then raise your hands uh, who, who wishes to take uh, the questions, the other two economic questions. Probably something for Raja, something for Stephen as well, but I call on Harsh first to answer the question directly addressed to him. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think the point that uh, increasingly you hear being made uh, in, in, in India, I had raised the question, the issue of self-reliance, uh, the issue that Prime Minister Modi had talked about, that one of the biggest lessons uh, of this crisis has been that you have to be self-reliant. I think it was not meant uh, as a critique of the larger project on globalization. I think it was meant uh, as, a, as a, you know, um, uh, you know, in some ways, uh, to rectify this perception that clearly what we have we have been witnessing over the last few decades is something uh, very fundamental. I think some some of the points that Raja has touched upon that you know you, we are looking at the globalization that is becoming very iniquitous, but also in terms of increasingly the use of trade uh, for geopolitical influence. You know, the the use of uh, trade, the weaponization of trade, uh, becoming a problem for a lot of countries, and that was uh, that is something that you see now in, in strategic sectors as, as you move forward and towards the fourth industrial revolution, as you look at this pandemic and you look at the crisis and you look at the situation with the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the, the questions are being raised that why is this, uh, you know, a crisis that was supposed to be the high point of liberal institutionalism, where when the, uh, when the honorable ambassador started off uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, discussion, he mentioned how this, this tells us that global co there is no um, uh, way out of global coordination. Global cooperation is imperative. And yet, when you see the performance, the behavior of certain key actors uh, during this crisis, you see a very uh, mercantilist behavior. You see a behavior that is uh, that is almost on par with a large, as if there is a trade war going on, as if you are using this pandemic uh, to make uh, not only personal gains but to preserve and expand your geopolitical influence. And that's where I think the point that Mr. Modi was trying to make was that look, for countries like India, it has now become imperative to think in those terms. Yes, we want globalization. India is a country that has benefited from globalization. But clearly, uh, in certain areas, we need to be self-reliant as we move forward. I know time is running out, uh, Federica, so I'll, I'll, I'll give others. Sure. Thank, thank you so much also for the discipline. So perhaps, Raja, on the no, no, I defer to other Stephen. economic tools. Stephen? Yeah. Oh, OK. It would be a bit rich for um, a humble lawyer to, to try and address the <laughs> questions. So I will, I will gladly leave them to, to some of my colleagues. But let me just say that the emblematic um, you know, reactions um, on, on self-preservation should, of course, be temporal. And uh, here, I think the EU and India really ought to come together in, 
in trying to uh, catalyze uh, a new momentum, either at a plurilateral or preferably, of course, at the multilateral level to, to address the issues that, we're, that we've talked about. This Bretton Woods moment is a, is a wonderful one, especially in the digital sphere, of course, where automation and uh, digitalization have already, prior to the crisis, been identified as key areas um, where our economies need to adapt and where the corona crisis has only amplified that, uh, that insight. And here, uh, like-minded middle powers will probably uh, provide, you know, the buttressing effect that is needed in order to snowball this effect at a multilateral level. Thank you so much. So on the tools for cooperation, perhaps it can be addressed in the last round of comments because we really um, run out of time. But I'd like to come to two questions uh, that take the EU-India cooperation head on. So one question is actually trying to, to make you focus or, or ask one pointed answer. The fundamental question is what is actually the impact of the COVID crisis on the EU-India relationship? Is the partnership getting closer? Are the partners coming closer together? Um, how will we deal with the global challenges together? And perhaps also a word on is cooperation more likely, including on climate change, which I think we, we may not have had the time to discuss uh, more in detail. Second question from this cluster is that since the fallout of the crisis will be so much on economics, is there actually a risk for the EU-India cooperation to slip back to an economic and trade cooperation focus and not leveraging the advantages that we have had and we've also discussed a lot in our ongoing uh, uh, communication conversations on increasing cooperation on strategic issues and in particular security issues. And then thirdly, uh, the issue of the relevance of migration was already mentioned. And obviously migration issues are also an object of a regular EU-India dialogue. And what are your thoughts on this going forward? So I would like to use this also as the final closing round since we're running out of time very soon. And perhaps um, start with, yeah, Shada, if you wish to start, then uh, we take it from there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll be very, very uh, short. But uh, the first question, will it impact on EU-India relations? Yes, it will, but in a positive way, I believe. Because as we've discussed up to now, well, of course, the EU-India summit uh, was postponed, clearly because of the crisis, but I'm being uh, reassured by my friends here that uh, an online perhaps something could be could be envisaged i know it's being envisaged with many many countries um, outside uh, in asia especially so i don't think that has really impacted uh, at the moment on on the way the cooperation is moving forward now it will depend a lot on how india responds as well to many of the issues that are on the table but i am convinced that economics and trade will not remain the center this world has changed so much of course this will be a very important uh, component of europe's relationship with asia more generally with china india japan etc but the world has changed so much over the last few years, and I've seen the evolution in the, in the discussions between EU, India, and others, that security issues, issues to do with migration, issues to do with the well-being of people, since, say, sustained modernization, this recovery, how are we going to make it an inclusive uh, and gender-focused recovery? I think these are issues that EU and India can work together. And the final point I'd say is really connectivity. This is going to be a very important source of fiscal stimulus across the world. And I'm not just talking about the Belt and Road Initiative of China. I'm talking about connectivity in digital, but also transport routes, connectivity in Africa. We need a fiscal stimulus. We need the economies back on track. And where can we get it? From these huge projects that are being envisaged in Japan, in India, in China, in the ASEAN countries. So I'd end with this. It's been a great conversation. I'm also, I have to say, Harsh, really, really uh, encouraged by the fact that the SARC uh, organization that has been dormant for so long and uh, grateful to Prime Minister Modi that he took the first steps to revitalize it. And I think regional cooperation, regional global, regional supply chains will become very important in this post-COVID era. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here as well. Thank you so much. May I invite closing remarks and addressing 
the rest of the questions in the reverse order. So Stephen first, then Harsh, then Fabian, then Raja, because we nearly need to close within the next three minutes or four minutes. Thank you. I'll be very Stephen? short. Uh, yeah, I, I think um, also answering a question which came from uh, Professor Samabava um, is that, of course, the EU is in a sweeter spot, perhaps unwittingly, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the G2, which allows cooperation with middle powers uh, around the world, including India, on a range of issues. And I agree with uh, Shada that they are wider than just uh, trade-related uh, aspects. Um, at the same time, um, uh, of course, there's, there's a danger that uh, one overlooks the ability of the Europeans to divide themselves. And the, the COVID crisis has um, has created new dividing lines, especially on issues of rule of law and, uh, and democracy uh, promotion, um, including those within the, the 17 plus one. And so we might see a shift, uh, in fact, of fragmentation within the European Union on these issues, whilst there has been a corrective uh, moment um, on, on the global outlook and especially vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, if, 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 the, if the trends continue, for example, two, two, uh, two aspects which are quite positive. One is uh, that uh, we have seen the debate shifting within Brussels on, on China in directions that perhaps India had wanted for a long time. A more honest, transparent debate about what China uh, is up to and then perhaps in, in, in line with what many in India have been arguing. So I think that that conversation has become more mature. The other, of course, is that India's own leadership has uh, that it has shown during this crisis. And this, this has been a persistent demand from our uh, from India's external mm. interlocutors, including European Union, that India should step up to the plate, become more of a rule player, a rule, rule maker, do more for the region. And I think all of those leadership during this crisis have been much in a, you know, much uh, on display. And clearly, I think that makes for a very potent relationship going forward. If, uh, as Stephen points out, European Union also needs to, uh, if, if, if those things get in order, then perhaps we are looking for a much more productive relationship. Thank you. Yeah, just to come in at the end, uh, yeah, I mean, three quick points. I think the first one, it's not a choice between economics and politics. And I think we have to walk on both the legs to use the old uh, Chinese saying that it's the because the structure on both the fronts is is weakening and both on the globalization economic globalization as well as on the multilateral political structures both are weakening therefore it's not a choice of doing on the one or the other second i think on the economic thing i, mean, I think uh, there is a conflation or a confusion between what happened after 1990 and what was there between 1945 and 1990 so the hyper globalization is what we are not going to go back to so there was a world that was not hyper-globalized between 45 and 1990. So, so there are different models, even in the post-war structure. So, so I think we we'll have to find a new mean because domestically, the redistributional effects, uh, the question of taking everyone along is going to compel us to redesign the structure. And that can be something different from what we've had uh, in the last uh, 30 years. On the political front, I think this thing has been linked, for example, some people are talking about supply chains being you know, shortened, uh, greater resilience, and that the key to this is actually collaboration, economic collaboration between free countries. Uh, this idea is brewing in Washington. I mean, I think we're going to see a lot more of this in the, in the days ahead. There's been some dialogue on the Quad Plus. So I think we, we're going to see a combination of where politics of bringing the like-minded, I think one of you used the term, like-minded countries together to be able to redesign uh, the global economic and political order both uh, is what's being debated. So I think I would just conclude by saying, uh, India and you are finally, I think, we're beginning to see more things together. Therefore, I think it's a moment of great opportunity for both of us as middle powers, as occupying different parts of a single continent, what we might call Eurasia. Uh, so I think it's an exciting period, I think, for Europe and India to, to think in bolder terms and thinking in fresh terms about economic and political cooperation. Thank you very much, Fabian, please, including remarks and pick up all questions that you still wanted to comment on. Sure. I'll, I'll try to be brief. Um, there are a lot of good questions, so I can't answer uh, all of them. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, for me, um, and as an economist, maybe I'm a bit reductionist there, but I, I, what I'm seeing is an enormous shift in the global economy. Um, which will have profound impacts. Uh, we are talking 
uh, about um, a global economic restructuring with uh, excess capacity in many different areas, with um, global value chains changing um, in part because of political decisions. Uh, we are talking about um, new sectors coming up. We're talking about winners and losers in this. Um, so this will have tremendous impact on employment. Uh, it will have tremendous impact on distribution um, of benefits and of costs, um, both within and between countries. So the big question for me is how do countries, how does the European Union deal with this major challenge? Um, because it will require different thinking. It will not be a question of simply going back to the recipes of the past. Um, and that uh, comes back to, in the end, a policy decision. And how far are we going uh, to work together in addressing these, or in how far are we going to try um, to do this on a national basis, on an inward-looking basis, on an isolation basis. I think the jury is still out, uh, and it is very much a choice we are having, um, rather than an inevitability one way or the other. Thank you. If I may bring this home to the issue of EU-India cooperation and the strategic partnership. This, I believe, is also a very important subject for EU-India conversation. We've been trying to enhance the, the economic dialogue also when it comes to economic global, global governance. So I'm really sorry, I need to wrap this up. Uh, so uh, dear speakers, dear, dear audience, many thanks for staying with us for what was a truly interesting and enriching discussion. As already underlined, this should be the start of a webinar series. And I think you've given us many good topics that, uh, are, that really could be the object of a deeper discussion, including the digital world, e-commerce, um, the right kind of inclusive and sustainable globalization, what kind of multilateral or other kinds of institutions do we use, need for that? Um, and then, of course, also connectivity uh, and regional cooperation issues, and then always injecting the EU-India angle into it, of course, which is of particular relevance to us. If I may add from my own, um, from my own conversations uh, and my own thinking, we could also pick up a little bit more on the role of civil society and the role of uh, the citizens, so to speak, when it comes to both working with the new state that we, uh, that we also spoke about and the citizens in, in their global connectivity and with their global contributions. It could be an interesting further topic. And in closing, um, I really don't dare to sum up such a, such a fascinating discussion. Um, but we know the crisis knows no borders yet uh, international collaboration is in question, has been questioned at least in the initial reaction phase. So what I take away from it is the need for more leadership and more communication. We need to speak more about what is right and what is functional at the same time and drive those points home and speak more about with each other. So more consultation, cooperation, collaboration, and also complementarity effort. I think something that we have often concluded out of, out of our think tank also seminars, but which is um, brought to the fore now even more acutely and as, as a greater global necessity has been confirmed again. So with that, I'd like to close. Thank you once again to all the speakers, to all the good questions that came from the audience. Rest assured, we will go through the questions and use them for the planning of the future webinars in this series. And final remarks, stay tuned on, as I have already announced on 9th of May, we will come out with a few posts and other products on social media in order to inform you more about EU-India cooperation and the EU's global contributions. So, I'm winding, thanking you very much. Have a nice afternoon, have a nice day in Brussels. Many thanks. Thank you, Frederick.